Hello everyone, my name is Professor John Dewar and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of La Trobe University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the fact that tonight's event and our participants are located on the lands of traditional custodians throughout Australia. I pay my respects to Indigenous Elders past and present and extend this respect to Indigenous participants joining us online. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this fourth event in this year's Ideas and Society series entitled Disability in Australian Society, How Well Are We Doing? Ideas and Society brings together some of the nation's most respected thinkers to talk about the big issues facing our region and the world. The series is curated by La Trobe University's Vice Chancellor's Fellow, Emeritus Professor Robert Mann, AO, who is presenting Ideas and Society for this 14th year in 2023. Previous events this year have looked at issues in the Indo-Pacific and Australia's defence policy and the housing crisis being felt across the nation. And in July, Noel Pearson talked about the referendum for a First Nations voice to the Australian Parliament. Later this year, there are two more events still to come. The first will be a discussion with the Foreign Minister of Taiwan, Joseph Wu, with Associate Professor Beck Straiting from the La Trobe Asia, uh, from La Trobe Asia um, which will look at Taiwan's perspectives on regional security issues. And that will be followed later in the year by an expert panel on the COVID-19 pandemic that will consider issues such as long COVID and whether the pandemic is actually over, as many people have assumed it is. All of these events, as always, cover matters that will define the future of our nation. And the topic of tonight's discussion is similarly nation-shaping and far-reaching. As Rob wrote in the event invitation, it's often said that the humanity of a society is best judged by the ways in which it treats its most vulnerable members. Sadly, the findings handed down last week by the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability tell us that we have some way still to go on this measure. But I'm delighted that we have one of the commissioners with us tonight to help us unpack the findings and the key ideas contained in the 222 recommendations made in the final report. And it's clear that we must act decisively to address the issues that the report uncovers. The latest intergenerational report released by Federal Treasurer Jim Chalmers in August showed that demographic change, demand for health and disability services, and the costs of meeting future demand present an urgent challenge for policymakers and service providers. Health, aged care, and the National Disability Insurance Scheme will account for a very significant portion of Commonwealth spending in 40 years time, with an aging and growing population putting immense pressure on federal government coffers. And while we digest the findings of the Royal Commission, we also await the report of the independent review into the NDIS, which is due to the responsible minister, Bill Shorten, later this month. And as I'm sure, as, as I'm sure tonight's experts will testify, while the NDIS has helped many Australians, there are still opportunities to improve the scheme and to implement broader reform in policy and practice across the whole care economy. Now, our panellists are eminently qualified to assess the current state of play in Australia for people with disability and for those who support them, and to outline what's needed to improve disability support services to meet current demand, as well as the significant growth projected in years ahead. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panel now. First of all, Dr. Rhonda Galbali, AC, who's been a CEO, a chair, and board member in the business, not-for-profit, and philanthropy sectors for over 30 years. As a woman with a lifelong disability, Rhonda first began focusing on disability rights and policy in the early 1980s, while working at the Victorian Council for Social Services. She served in roles including the CEO of the Sydney Meyer Fund and the Meyer Foundation, and chair of the Australian Association of Philanthropy and the Royal Women's Hospital. Rhonda established the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, now known as Vic Health, 
and has been appointed to lead numerous government reviews. She was a member of the expert four-person panel that developed the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. She chaired the federal government's National People with Disability and Carers Council and was a board member of the NDIS. She's currently a commissioner serving on the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. Micheline Lee's latest work is the quarterly essay, Lifeboat, Disability, Humanity and the NDIS. And her novel, The Healing Party, was shortlisted for several awards, including the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. Micheline is a former human rights lawyer and painter and is currently completing a PhD. She has lived with motor neurone disability from birth. Elle Gibbs is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Disability Advocacy Network Australia. Elle is a seasoned advocate, a communications specialist, and an expert on the NDIS. She's devoted over 15 years to working in policy, strategy, and advocacy for the rights of people with disability, and is a highly respected policy expert in this field. Elle is also herself a disabled person and has worked in senior roles for a variety of national disability peak organizations. She writes regularly on the NDIS and disability issues. Tonight's discussion will be chaired by our very own Professor Christine Bigby, Director of the Living with Disability Research Center at La Trobe University. Chris has a long track record of working in partnership with disability organizations and with people with intellectual disabilities. Her research aims to develop evidence to improve the effectiveness of practice and programs that support social inclusion of adults with intellectual disabilities. And in 2023, she completed a major report for the Royal Commission on the overarching principles and elements of the framework needed to implement supported decision-making. The Royal Commission report also recommends steps to improve practice that are aligned with longitud the longitudinal research that Chris has done on group homes since 2009. And it also drew on her testimony about culture in group homes and on a research report about abuse of LGBTIQA plus people with a disability that was done in partnership between the Trobe University's Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society, or Archers, and Chris's Living with Disability Research Centre. So Chris will now lead a discussion with the panel, with the panel, and then we'll have time for our audience to submit questions. So it's now my enormous pleasure to hand over to Chris to get tonight's discussion underway. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, John, for the introductions and um, good evening to everybody and thank you very much for coming. I also want to thank Robert Mann for putting this panel together um, and inviting me to chair it. Um, the theme for the discussion tonight is disability in Australian society um, and how, how are we doing and how far have we come. The anchor point for me is the, one of the anchor points, is the La Trobe Ideas and Society event that I chaired in 2011, which is a long time ago, at which Rhonda Galberly also spoke, and Bruce Boney Haley, John Della Bosca, and Professor Jim Mansell. And at that time, they reviewed the Productivity Commission report on disability care and support that actually provided the blueprint for the NDIS. It was a very interesting discussion and it reminds one about the roots of, of the NDIS and the very lofty visions that we had for it. If you're interested, there's a recording of that on the resources tab. Since that time, the NDIS has been implemented and fully rolled out across Australia. Clearly, it hasn't been a smooth process. There's been countless parliamentary and other inquiries into its operation. And as Bruce famously said, it was being built while they were also trying to fly it. And this had a huge impact on the realisation of the scheme's potential and meant that it's been subject to continual change over the last 10 years. There's also significant evidence to suggest that there's major inequities in the scheme, or that in particular people with intellectual disabilities have least benefited from the scheme compared to some of the other groups. Currently, as John said, there's a major review underway, which is co-chaired by Bruce Bonihady 
and the senior public servant, Lisa Paul. And already they've foreshadowed that there will be major changes um, to the NDIS um, and their report will come out at, in the middle of this month. The individualised funding component, which was originally called Tier 3 of the NDS, now includes many more participants than was originally anticipated. The numbers currently stand at 610,502 people, which is much higher than the 410,000 originally anticipated. People who, are, who receive individualised packages represent those with most severe and profound disabilities, who receive funding to purchase reasonable and necessary individual support that they need to lead their lives and to participate in the community. But individualised support is only part of what people with disabilities need to participate. And the NDIS, participants in the NDIS, make up a very small fraction of the estimated 4.4 million people with disabilities of all ages who make up about 18% of the population. For all people with disabilities, whether, in, whether they're in the scheme or not, it's the inclusive nature of society that also makes a very significant difference to their quality of life. Things such as community attitudes towards people with disabilities, the availability of employment opportunities, access and responsibilities, responsiveness of mainstream services such as health, housing, transport and education. Creating a more inclusive society as a primary means of preventing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disabilities has been at the core of the work of the Disability Royal Commission for the first four and a half years. And its report was tabled, as you know, in Parliament last Friday. I doubt that most people have had time to fully digest its 12 volumes and 222 recommendations, but it provides some far ranging evidence about past and current experiences of people with disability in society. And the volumes reflect the changes that have occurred over time, how far society has come and how much further there is to go. And it makes some very, very significant recommendations for structural change in our society. But it also raises some fundamental issues for debate. What does an inclusive society actually look like and how should we get there? What do we mean by segregation? What do we mean by mainstream services? And what are the differences between mainstream and specialist services? Is there a place for all types of services? What is the place for choice in deciding what services to use? And whose voices should hold most weight in thinking about the future of disability services and an inclusive society. So as John said, there are three speakers tonight um, who are going to turn their um, cameras and sound on so that we can see them. Um, and they each bring very different perspectives to some of these broad questions. As you heard from John, they all have lived experiences of disability and they're going to reflect on some of the successes of the NDIS and some of the issues raised by the Royal Commission and its recommendations. There will be time for questions, but we're not going to be able to unpack the entire 12 volumes um, of the Royal Commission report, unfortunately, and I think that will have to, um, much of that will have to carry over for another time. Um, the first person that we're going to, who's going to join the conversation, I'm hoping, um, is Michelle and Lee who, as John said, authored the quarterly essay. Can people put their cameras on? So Micheline Lee, in this essay, weaves personal and political together, and she considers the reasons behind the NDIS and the aspects of it that have worked well for herself, and she also unpicks some of the failings and considers what the broader transformation is required to realise the human rights of people with disabilities. So Micheline, I'd like to start by asking you some questions, but I'd really like you to put your camera on first so that other people can see you. Are you able to do that? Um, I just need the host to allow my video. You should be able to do it. 
No, I'm getting a message saying unable to start video. You can't start your video because the host hasn't enabled it or because the host has stopped it. Oh, okay. So we'll ask Tori if she can put your video on. Oh, now I'm on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that glitch. So Michelin. When Bruce Boney Hady spoke at the at the Ideas and Society event in 2011, he made a statement that for people with disability, the NDIS would be like going shopping for support, that it would give people choice and control over the supports that they wanted to buy, and they'd have enough funding through the NDIS to do that. So can we start off, would you like to talk a bit about what it's been like for you? and how well this individualised and marketised system has worked? Go shopping for supports, I like that. If only it was that simple. <laughs> to continue the NDIS shopping imagery, I'd say sometimes the shops aren't accessible and you can't get there, or you might make it into the shop only to find the shelves are empty. I'd like to just um, start by emphasising that disability people are diverse. I'm relatively advantaged because I can advocate for myself. For those who can't or who don't have someone to advocate for them, they have been much less able to benefit from the NDIS and in some cases have actually been worse off as a result of the NDIS. Because of the increased funding, given by the NDIS, I can now pay for the support workers I need to be able to live independently at home. I need hands-on assistance for nearly all my daily living tasks of getting out of bed, showering, meal preparation, etc. My condition is progressive and if it wasn't for the NDIS, I would be at risk of having to go into a group home when my needs become higher but I still have to fight to get the supports. I have to fight for the funding I need. I struggle to find suitable support workers because they are in short supply and I can't find anyone to fix my electric wheelchair because it needs complex customization and the providers don't want to do it because there's not enough profit in it. But many other NDIS participants experience far more challenges in accessing the NDIS than me. More than half of the NDIS participants have a cognitive impairment, yet the NDIS is so complicated that even seasoned bureaucrats say they find the NDIS hard to understand and access. The NDIS hasn't taken into account the different contexts and capabilities of disabled persons. People who are seen by support providers as having difficult behaviour might be seen as a business risk, so get no support. First Nations peoples in remote communities have little chance of getting supports where they are, so have to move to bigger towns and lose connection with their traditional land. The NDIs really needs to respond to the reality of who we are. We're not the idealised consumers they imagine. So the market system that was introduced by the NDIS, was it what you expected it to be? Um, did you expect state governments, for example, to withdraw services, withdraw from disability services? I didn't expect that um, complete with withdrawal. Um, I expected... There is some market stewardship with the NDIS, but I expected it to um, be more effective and um, resourced than it has been. I remember in 2017 hearing about Francis' case. I was totally shocked and angry. So um, Francis was a 20-year-old man with a severe intellectual disability who needed 24-hour high-needs care. He committed a minor assault for which no one would end up in prison, particularly someone like Francis, with no history of offending. Yet Francis ended up spending a total of 180 days in prison. He spent that time in prison because no service providers could be found to care for him in his home. So the magistrate couldn't let Francis go home without those supports he needed. 
Francis' service provider refused to care for him, describing him as a business risk and no other agency would accept him. Legal Aid sought the help of the NDIA in providing, uh, in finding a provider of last resort for Francis, but the NDIA denied responsibility, saying it was a bank, just a bank. I didn't imagine that the government would choose such a classic market system after all the evidence available in the last decade of how market approaches are inequitable and fail to deliver, particularly in social supports. I thought, as I said, more market stewardship would be available, that there would be intermediaries that would help people get and use the supports they needed. I didn't expect that government would outsource its responsibilities to a profit-driven market. The NDIS did set up a system of support coordinators and local area coordinators, but these were inadequately resourced and badly set up so they weren't properly effective. So it's interesting, the Royal Commission report has actually uh, made some recommendations about um, state governments and federal governments getting together to address the issue of providers of last resort. So it's taken a long time to recognise that, hasn't it? Um, but that should help to address some of those issues with the market. Yes, we need more than um, a provider of last resort. We need, so it's not enough to actually provide the funds. People need to actually have the capacity to translate those funds into the supports that they need and into um, participation. Um, and a market system imagines that where there's money, services will flow and improve through competition and that there should be minimum involvement in government, of government. But in reality, services flow where profits are most easily made. So we have this problem of thin markets, which compromises choice and control. Um, further, there needs to be a lot more protection for people who are isolated um, and vulnerable. And the NDIS provides little accountability for the quality of the services or its safety. A de yeah. Go on. Well, interestingly, a decade ago, services were cr criticised for being overprotective. It seems to have gone the other way now that the, with the market system, we've been put into the roles of idealised consumers. And if I may um, illustrate this, um, in the case of Anne-Marie Smith, the NDIS should have picked up that she had complex needs and was isolated, but they left her at the mercy of a sole support provider <clears throat> who criminally neglected her until she died. We seem to only be able to think in binaries, either you have capacity or you don't. The NDIS adopts the presumption that people have the capacity to manage their supports themselves, but they've misinterpreted self-determination as meaning doing it on your own. Amory needed support in order to exercise control over her services. And... Would you say we also need a, a, a stronger regulation of the market and much more monitoring or supervision or better qualified skilled and skilled workers to deliver services as a safeguard as well? Yes, we need to have um, some kind of guarantee of, of the adequacy of services. So we're experiencing an influx of um, support workers and, um, and other staff who are just not trained in order to provide a service that actually responds to a person's needs. Um, people with um, intellectual disabilities um, need, as you would know, Christine, because you've done a lot of work in this area, need active, active support, people who can actually involve them rather than you know, sit them in front of the TV um, and people um, with mental health 
problems may want to have recovery coaching. Um, and there is a shortage of, of this, this um, training. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, we might move on to issues about mainstream services. You make the point that really the individualised funding is never going to be enough um, to really make change and to, to support people to be included. Well, one of the things you say in your essay is that access to mainstream services has probably got worse since the NDIS was introduced. Um, can you talk about, about why you think that's the case and some of the barriers that you're coming up against and how it's got worse in the last few years? Yes, um, when the NDIS um, was introduced, it claimed to be a, a social model that actually acknowledges that it is the structures of society um, that exclude us and that, you know, we're disabled not just by our own bodies, but by society being designed for an unrealistic able-bodied norm. Um, but when the NDIS was implemented, all the emphasis was put on the um, almost a medical model of disability, where it was very much about um, fixing the individual through the supports. And this wasn't really translating into um, greater participation um, and, um, and addressing the barriers in society. So, you know, the kind of barriers in society are employment being inflexible, for example, education not catering for kids with learning difficulties, inaccessible buildings and housings, health systems that don't cater for people with cognitive impairments. So society needs to provide um, universal access and be inclusive of people with disabilities. But what we've seen is that the emphasis on individual supports has meant a neglect of, this, of societal inclusivity. Disability services that existed within the community have been depleted, such as local government and HACC services, so that now if you're disabled and need some supports but don't qualify for the NDIS, you get nothing. Um, also, you see the lack of, of priority now for, um, for the access within the broader community in examples like our public transport system still being inaccessible. Um, although 20 years ago, there was a commitment made under the Disability Discrimination Act to make public transport um, meet um, minimum access standards. Those standards, um, that, that 20 years expired a few months ago and still um, with the whole 20 years of, um, in, of implementation time, those minimum standards still haven't been achieved. So Bill Shorten used the term lifeboat as the mainstream access we need is being depleted, we're finding we're scrambling to get onto this lifeboat and even um, more desperate to, to get onto the NDIS. Um, so so you, you talk about the need for a, um, a much broader social transformation to, to remove some of these barriers. What does that look like from your perspective and how might that be achieved? So the um, NDIS review will come up, I'm sure, with um, very valuable reforms um, in relation to um, how to um, soften the market system and provide more diversity um, and responding. But I would like to look um, at some of the underlying factors um, as to why we haven't been able to meet the goals of the NDIS in the first place. So we had, you know, wonderful goals um, with the NDIS, but when it was being implemented, um, 
we fell into the same old cultural ruts of, of um, not really understanding disability and and the um, and how disadvantage is actually caused in society. And how we understand disability affects how we respond to it. When we were seen as tragic, we were treated as objects of charity. When we were seen as abnormal and and um, and as being um, and having deficits, they tried to cure us. Then the NDIS saw us as consumers. So disability needs to be seen as part of the normal variation of life so that the measures to make society inclusive are also normal and expected rather than seen as a burden. Uh, we really need the voice and leadership of people with disabilities. We're the experts on what we need and on how structures need to change. And it's very important not to neglect um, the social structures. Um, and this, the, the removing the barriers um, to the society, to society becoming more inclusive and actually having that structural approach rather just rather than just an individual one. And I guess as part of this responding to the reality of um, people's needs, the NDIS has to work out how to give people choice and control without throwing them at the mercy of the market. So there's other, there's other mechanisms that have existed for a long time um, in terms of, of building social inclusion, things like the National Disability Strategy and anti-discrimination laws. Why haven't they been successful and how might those things need to change, do you think? Um, the Australian um, Disability Strategy does focus on the steps that need to be made to achieve a more inclusive society. Um, but as disability organisations such as the PWDA have um, commented, its pr proposed outcomes are not specific enough and it, it has no teeth. Um, and so its effectiveness has been um, very limited. Um, Anti-discrimination law um, you know, was a game changer when it was, um, disability discrimination laws was a game changer when it, when it was introduced in, in 1992, um, in that it really had an educative effect about um, not discriminating um, and that discriminate, um, that, that discrimination was against the law um, and, but the shortcoming of disability discrimination laws is, a, is that it has a very individual rights focus. It assumes that discrimination is caused by an individual who treats you unequally because of your disability. Most discrimination, however, flows from society structures and, and discrimination law um, was not effective in relation to addressing society structures. So an, an education system that is not adequately resourced to accommodate different learning needs or a criminal justice system that disadvantages people with cognitive disabilities, we found that discrimination law just wasn't, um, didn't have the broader reach um, that was needed in order to, to address these structural problems. And that's that's a there's a whole um chapter, whole volume in the in the Royal Commission recommendations, isn't there, about reforming um anti-discrimination law and introducing a much broader disability rights act. Um have you yes. had a chance to have a look at that? Um I've only had a quick look at the summaries, um, but um, the Disability Rights Act is something that I've been wanting for a, a long time um, because as Australia ratified the Con United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but it hasn't implemented um, the um, rights um, by le legislation. 
And that means that decision makers and government don't see the CRPD um, as binding. So it's really important that um, we do implement um, the convention or the CRPD in legislation in order that it does ha actually have um, more teeth and it is binding. And, um, and just like the Disability Discrimination Act, had, it's a lot of power because they're saying it's law, um, so will the Disability um, Rights Act if we can say it's law. And it also just has a very important um, educative and cultural change approach because one of the reasons behind um, our failure to um, achieve equality is because we don't have a, um, a more realistic understanding of, of um, what you need for equality. We, we still think that to treat people equally, we need to, to treat people the same. Um, the CRPD um, actually has equality at the core um, of its um, is is at the core of the convention, and it's based on a multi-dimensional um, view of equality. It's based, which is called inclusive equality, um, and that involves making sure that when you actually make a reform, that it actually responds to people's different capabilities, needs and contexts. So to, uh, to exercise real choice and control means having the necessary supports to be able to exercise this choice and control, for example. The second um, dimension of in inclusive e equality requires recognition of equality um, and redressing stigma um, and stereotyping. And that's a very important part of the cultural change as well, because if we don't recognise um, people with disabilities as equal, we're less likely to make the changes that are needed in order to achieve more fairness. And the third dimension calls for participation and inclusion in society, and particularly that disabled persons must be involved at every level of decision making in matters concerning them. And finally, it's about the need for structural change um, and to uh, actually accommodate difference, to be universal and to, rem to remove barriers that prevent inclusion. And I must say that your your essay explains some of those issues very well in a in a really understandable way. And the Royal Commission also goes on and, and talks extensively about issues about substantive equity um, rather than the very sort of simple equity that we tend to think about and we've got in the current legislation. So it might be a good time to, to um, introduce Rhonda. Um, and, and everybody will be very familiar, I think, with Rhonda, who's featured a lot in the press in the last few days, but also has a very, very long history of being a disability activist and thought leader. Um, and it's very clear, I think, Rhonda, that your views, particularly around issues of segregation and the things that create major obstacles to an inclusive society, um, have been very prominent in the last few days and in the Royal Commission report. But before we talk about, about that, let's go back to uh, Michelin's essay. And, and do you have some views about the NDIS? And um, from your perspective, how well has it, has it gone? Um, has it achieved what you hoped it would? Are you there, Rhonda? I think Rhonda's frozen, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to move on on to Elle because I think, oh, Rhonda, are you back? Yeah, I'm back, yeah, I've just popped back. But I hope if I go again, move to Elle because I there is sort of trouble because of the, the rain, I think, in Melbourne, yeah. Okay, 
So did you hear, I, I was just asking you if you would reflect on the NDIS and how well it's gone from your perspective. Did it, has it achieved what you hoped it would achieve? Look, I wonder if you'd indulge me before I do that. Now I'm a free woman, no longer a commissioner. I'd like to start by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and to elders past, present and future and say that I'm definitely going to vote yes because I haven't because we weren't able to say things like that as commissioners. So I feel really good being able to say that. So that's <laughs> the start. And okay. the second thing I wanted to say is, Micheline, it's what a wonderful quarterly essay and I do hope everybody watching um, this tonight will go and get a copy of it and read it. It's really tremendous and so um, valuable the way you've woven your personal stories and made it come alive. It's very dynamic because it's quite dry, hard stuff and yet there it is leaping off the page like a really good read. So thank you so much from me because I learned a lot from it. So 10 years ago, you know, the hopes were enormous. Um, and I do remember 2011 coming along to the same um, seminar and just, you know, so hopeful and the Productivity Commission report and all the efforts. But I, I just want to say at the outset that we all came together because, you know, to do this, to get this across the line. But I think there were a lot of different expectations from the NDIS, from different parts of disability. So I think that, you know, you, we might want to return to that because I've thought a lot about that, that we put all our differences aside about our vision for the life for people with disabilities. We put all that aside and we fought, you know, and campaigned to get the NDIS. And in some ways, I think that the different visions for people's lives um, have sort of are still there, you know. And um, so, and Micheline sort of touches on that when she talks about market stewardship. So, first of all, one of the positives is that I think it'd be over two thirds of the over 600,000 are absolutely new participants. So, they didn't have anything at all, and we're never going to have anything. Um, by the look of it. And if they were, it would have been a block funded something um, where the service provider would have completely dictated it. So it's a really, um, you know, it's transformational um, for those people to have something that they can use um, for their lives. And over 30% of that, of the whole group, are really self-managing and the value of that is that they're able um, to really be flexible, relatively flexible, perhaps not flexible enough even, but relatively flexible in thinking through different ways of living and being able to go and put that together. You know, I've met loads of families who aren't using traditional support workers at all, they're matching interests, um, you know, they're doing all sorts of things. And in fact, you know, they're thereby um, being able to um, move into art and all sorts of things with a different vision. So I think that self-managing, while that's a technical term, and I don't mean it just as paying your own bills, it's a self-direction, which is really core to the NDIS from my point of view. But I don't think it was core to everyone's point of view in that coalition, but it was very core to me. And so the interesting thing about Micheline's essay is self-direction um, and consumer, are they different? And I think they sort of are. Um, so I think that's worth um, threading too. Um, there's been progress towards um, proportionate participation, which Micheline's essay raises um, about um, First Nations participants. They're now up to 11%, only recently, far too late, it should have been earlier, but still better late than never. 
the cold um, percentage, the um, culturally and linguistically diverse percentage isn't um, good enough yet by any means. And I guess another thing is, and related to the self-direction, there are pockets of incredible innovation um, that are really hard and you hear about it all the time. But the trouble with that is, and I think it relates to Micheline's point of market stewardship, there's no strategy that I can see for lifting up the innovation and extending it across the country in a programmatic sense. Um, Planning Micheline's essay goes into it in detail is a nightmare. And it's not planning at all. It's really resource allocation. And when you think about it, that there's 10,000 funding decisions a week, that's not planning. So, you know, expecting that the planning would be from, um, you know, employ public servants, I think is very unrealistic. And so, you know, in terms of fixing this, the people who can plan best are the people with disabilities. And remembering um, the whole issue of cognitive disability, that then relates to your huge um, contribution, Chris, in supported decision-making, of course because they can also plan and have vision and have a view and be listened to and self-direct, and so they should. So the, the I don't want to go on too long, but the supply side has tripled. You know, so that's a huge boost to service provision and service providers, but we're not getting new models of creative supply at all. We're getting more of the same, and that's incredibly disappointing. And that's because we don't seem to have incentives or levers. They haven't been um, built in and designed. And that could go back to the original differences that I point to, where I'm not sure that there's a desire for new and creative and different design. But I think there is, and you know, we, we thought we might have a separate seminar on in detail on some of these issues, but I think there is a need in group homes, day programs and sheltered workshops. So I've got other thing. I, I agree with Micheline completely on tier two. Um, you know, and the state service systems have dropped out. You know, they, they're they not um, performing at all in health, housing, as you said, Micheline, transport and education. So there's many other things one could say. I think one of the most significant things, uh, Rhonda, is is that, you know, self-direction and being a consumer for people with cognitive disabilities requires significant support. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. what we've seen is people with very resourceful families with social capital have been able to do that. But the scheme didn't provide that support for people, many people who don't have resourceful families to support them to do that. And I think as, as Michelin's essay talks about too, it takes an awful lot of time and energy um, from families and from individuals to be consumers. I don't think people expected the, the weight of time that it would take to do that. Um, it hasn't been made easy for people, I don't think. No, but part of that time is this nightmare of process that's just terrible and it's uh, you know I feel so sorry it's come to that and Micheline describes that really well mm. I think that self-direction for people with cognitive disability taking the time and support we should do it it's absolutely vital it's got to be built in and your and the supported decision making um, is the way to go and you put it in, in resources and all sorts of advice around that and uh, the agency, I think, has adopted that too recently based on your work. So I think it's just really um, critical because, you know, it's, it's everybody with disability. It's, um, and people who have cognitive disability, it's vital that they're able to make their own decisions and be taken seriously and express preferences and... And that's what self-direction means that's not, that's got, you know, without addressing the 
the vulgar consumerist um, aspect of it. I think self-direction is a, 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 an issue that's, that's so highly cherished that, and this is the first time we've had it really. And to yeah. have it on mass, yeah, is really something. Yeah. And it's the first time we've had some really major recommendations around embedding supported decision making in all service systems, but also reforming the guardianship system. But I just want to move on, Rhonda, um, a little bit in terms of the, thinking about the Royal Commission. One of the things that really struck me I mean, in 2007, you talked about putting differences aside between advocacy groups and really um, trying to avoid the infighting that was very characteristic of the disability sector. But there seems to have been, uh, with the report of the Royal Commission, this, there is a split between yourself and some of the other commissioners and, and the chair around issues of segregation and closure of special schools and group homes and ADEs, and they seem to have dominated um, the media. Can you talk a little bit about why, for you and the other commissioners, the issues about segregation as being fundamental to achieving social change were so important that you, you couldn't agree on a position? Well, it was sort of um, surprising to me. So, you know, because um, it's, I don't want to use um, language that, um, but it's, it's a really painful topic um, to think that there are people who are regarded as so disabled that we as a society aren't prepared to really have them living and learning and working and playing, you know, alongside every, all of us. Um, you know, it's, to me, this is a, an absolutely um, critical issue, not only about human rights, and of course it is the basis of the convention that Micheline's referred to, but of humanity, of a, of a society where, pe where people are, with all their diversity and all their differences, no matter what their disability, where they can be in the world, um, learning cheek to cheek. And, you know, I'm, don't forget, I don't want to, I just want to say that, you know, the responsible phase in proposals, you know, it's been incredibly thought through so that nobody would be disadvantaged in one of these settings. They could stay there. There's a long time until, you know, there's change and deep planning and, um, you know, really important um, thought to go into it. But that ultimately, why people with disabilities feel so passionate, and Elle and Micheline, you come in on this, is that, you know, it's, it's for me, you know, and I've, I've often been accused in the last 50 years of it's all very well for me, you know, I'm verbal and, you know, not cognitively disabled. But I see it as me, you know, that we've got to have all, everyone accepted. Everyone's got to be there. It's not just the me's in the world where, you know, I was able to negotiate a, an inclusive life with my family supporting that. It's that, you, you know, a parent goes to a school or thinks about a living possibility, unfortunately still with the NDIS even, and the creative possibilities for their loved one to be out in the world, they're blocked, you know, and there's barriers and they're not welcome and they're not allowed to be there. And, um, you know, they no, it's for you to go over here where you'll be safe. Well, the second thing I want to say is that they're clearly not safe, you know, and that's become very clear in the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. But they're also not safe when they do come out into the world because nobody's ever met them as little children. And when little children are in together in a well, you know, in a properly inclusive environment, they accept each other and they help each other. And they, you know, an inclusive environment is a no um, tolerance of bullying, by the way. So these are environments that do exist around Australia. 
there aren't nearly enough of them, but where they exist, um, the children who are not disabled gain as much, if not more, than the children who are disabled. And then they come out and they wouldn't dream of um, uh, being a perpetrator of violence, abuse, neglect and abuse and exploitation because they're, you know, they're used to them. They're not going to discriminate, you know. So it's no good spending money on attitudinal change campaigns with ads if we're not um, really including people from the word go. So I think, I mean, Robert made, Robert Mann said, humanity and society is judged by the way it treats people. I would change treats to includes. <laughs> and I mean, you know, fully includes. So we might we might go to Elle now, who who's a very experienced advocate for for Dana, one of the national organisations. And I and I know um, Elle's expertise lies particularly around issues related to employment of people with intellectual disabilities. And 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 I really would like you a little bit, Elle, to talk about what are your views about segregation? Is it as cut and dried as as Rhonda suggests? And is there a place for things like ADEs? Yeah, so thanks for having me here. And I wanted to echo Rhonda's uh, thanks of Michelin for such a fantastic essay. I was privileged to review it and uh, it was great to see some of my wonkier or the wonkier ways that that, that uh, we talk about the NDIS in, in the disability advocacy world translated for um people to understand the impact of it and the challenges with the NDIS. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, last year I was really lucky enough to work with um, some fantastic um, folks with intellectual disability who had worked in ADEs uh, in a big project to look at what is the future of ADEs, what is the future of um, sub-minimum wages, supported wages, and what do people with intellectual disability want from, from ADEs, but also from employment more generally and their families. And so we did a whole lot of things. Uh, we did everything from economic modelling to uh, a steering committee that was run by people with an intellectual disability who had worked in ADEs. Um, our project staff, people with intellectual disability, did much of the stakeholder engagement. Um, and this was all done through Inclusion Australia, which is the peak body for people with intellectual disability and their families, and funded by philanthropy. And so through the project, it was really interesting because people with an intellectual disability, the first thing that they wanted to change was the wages that they were paid. That was the number one thing that they wanted to change. The next thing was that they wanted choices. They wanted options. They wanted places where people were kind to them. They wanted places that were easy to get to. They wanted work that was interesting. They wanted work where they earned enough money to take their friend out to dinner, where they could go to a musical, where they could save up and buy a car, where they could go on a holiday. They were the things that people talked to us about what was really important to them. What families really wanted was um, work that meant that the burden didn't fall back on them about supporting a person with intellectual disability with the day-to-day -day practicalities of getting to work, managing work, dealing with work, doing all of those things. ADEs take care of all of those things. And so for many families, the choices were about sending someone to work in an ADE or giving up work themselves so that the person could be supported into employment. So it was really clear that the barriers in mainstream employment for people with intellectual disability are enormous. And the majority of people with intellectual disability don't work at all. So that's over 60% of people. And of the people who do work, the majority do work for supported wages, which is well under the minimum wage and sometimes as low as 10%. Um, so at the moment, that's a grand total of about $2.90 an hour. Um, people could be paid $7 an hour to drive a forklift. So I think um, it was really interesting, the work that we did uh, and all of the consultation. At the end of it, we didn't recommend to close ADEs. But what we did recommend was a very clear five-year transition of both mainstream employment and supported employment. And as the very first step, that people with an intellectual disability were paid the minimum wage from day dot so that they didn't have to still wait in poverty while all of the rest of us did all of the rest of the changes. And it was really important to take those steps about 
the mainstream employment has to change uh, and the expertise that does exist in some ADEs around supporting people with intellectual disability at work was actually moved into the mainstream. So my understanding is that the productivity wages are also paid to people that are working in the mainstream. So what do you see as the future about productivity wages? Like, are you suggesting we should remove them altogether and people should, everybody should be paid the minimum wage for the hours that they work? Is that the position that you would take? Yes, it is absolutely the position I would take. I wouldn't be a good union member if I didn't. <laughs> But I also think that it is worth recognising that when people are learning about work, particularly for people who've never been in work before or when people are starting work for the first time, we have a system around traineeships and apprenticeship wages currently. And I think that kind of system could certainly be adapted as a program, particularly for people who are coming out of a day program or coming out of work who've never worked before who need to understand and do training about being at work and need to learn many things. And I think there is a place for that kind of traineeship wages, as there are for everybody else. But the evidence is really strong, and it's one of the things that I know Rhonda will talk about, well, no, knows about, but in lots of disability advocacy, in lots of disability world, the evidence isn't always strong. But in the employment of people with intellectual disability, there is decades of really good quality evidence about how to support people really well and what, we, what that has found really clearly is if you do job customisation, if you find what people are interested in and you give them the right support, people are just as productive as anybody else. And the data is really clear. So I don't have productivity wages applied to me. The really slack person in, my, in the office doesn't also have productivity wages applied to them. So I don't understand. They only apply to people with an intellectual disability. And I think that it is an anomaly in our... Um, industrial relations system that does yes need to be changed so there's often a fine line in the disability world around employment and day programs and volunteering so there's there's lots of smaller programs where people might not be called employment but they're working in work crews or gardening crews or they're just volunteering their time in in the local op shop so do you see a place for those things to continue? Um... I, look, I think volunteering is great. I volunteer, lots of people do volunteer, but I think calling it work when it's not work and paying, not paying people properly when it actually should be work is the kind of thing that unions have been campaigning against for a long time. So I don't see why that should only apply to people with an intellectual disability. I think if people want to get together and do recreation activities, again, that is totally fine. I do that with my friends. But I think when we're talking about work, I think people should have an opportunity to work and to earn money, just like everybody else, and to be able to be part of the community alongside everybody else with the right support. Like, I want to be really clear around that, that people with an intellectual disability often need ongoing support at work, always, and that's totally fine. And through the NDIS, through the Disability Employment System, we should be able to manage to support people with intellectual disability at work and to do that in the variety of ways that people need to and want to. So being very clear about what's work and what's not work and what's volunteering and what's what's learning. One of the one of the things in the Royal Commission report talked about was the further development of social firms and I got really confused because it didn't really define what that was and people use social enterprise sort of interchangeably with social firms. So can you talk a bit about what the difference is and what that term means from your perspective? I might defer to Commissioner, ex-Commissioner Galbally on that one. Um, what did you mean, Rhonda? <laughs> well, I mean, the term social enterprise is, is used a lot to describe all manner of things including um, some of the programs you just referred to, Chris, um, you know, some of the volunteering and the gardening and endless training. So the social firm, um, my understanding is it was, it emerged in Scotland initially, and it was in the psychosocial disability space initially too. And it's half disabled, half non-disabled workers working together paying award wages from the very beginning. 
and you know the business case stacks up really and I've never understood in Australia um, frankly why ADE's sheltered workshops haven't moved to a social firm model some have there's some really good examples um, in in Victoria actually and I'm sure there are in other states too but they no longer call themselves an ADE because they you know they're I mean, they're not really. So, so there's a huge opportunity in this, in this, with these 600 ADEs to transform their model and still stay in business if they want to. Um, but it would be a mixed workforce and it would be um, award wages for sure. And that mixed workforce is actually really important to um, the business sustainability of ADEs. So in terms of paying people higher wages, you need to have the um, kind of mixture of productivity and the mixture of support to actually make the business model for some of those things work. So that was the findings of some of our research from last year. Um, and it was really helpful because we did it with some of the service providers and there has been a lot of changes in where service providers are, when the ADEs are. So some of them have got much bigger and are running these kind of commercial enterprises and others of them are much smaller. So... I think it will be interesting to see where they are. They are certainly at the table having this conversation as we speak. So thanks. We're starting to get some, some questions um, from the audience, but one of, one of the things that's sort of coming up in that is, is the issue of, of who speaks for who in debates about um, disability. And the Royal Commission has clearly given a huge amount of attention to hearing the testimony of people with disabilities themselves. And several of the commissioners, including Rhonda, have called for much greater weight to be given to the lived experience of people with disabilities in formation of policy and co-designing and co-producing disability support services. But there's been a sort of backlash, I think, in the media suggesting that it's that lived experience is really important, but that people with particular types of lived experience, like physical or sensory disabilities, can't actually speak for other people with other types of lived experience, particularly people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I'm just wondering whether you think people with different types of lived experience can represent people with disability in general, um, or does it need to be much more nuanced? I know you, you feel quite strongly about this, Elle. I do, Chris. Um, look, I think it is, and, and I have found some of the commentary um, challenging let's put it that way um i think for those of us who work in disability advocacy like lots of other people who develop professional expertise um as people with disability we are not expected to only develop expertise about ourselves <laughs> and i think it is quite um astonishing sometimes to to read things where I'm expected to only be a, 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 a able to talk about my own direct experience. No, and it's only for non-disabled people to develop expertise about disability as a whole, um, which I find extremely challenging. Um, I think that in the disability community, we don't always do well at including people with intellectual disability in a really doing it properly, taking the time, making sure people have support, making sure that things are fully accessible. And it is something that lots of us are working very hard to do better and to make sure that we are having conversations where if we are having a conversation about intellectual disability, people with intellectual disability need to be in the room and need to be part of the conversation. And so do their families. And I think that that is also a challenging conversation that for families to think through how they talk about disability when they aren't disabled people, I also think is a really challenging conversation. Um, and some of the best, as I often say, some of my best friends are parents, um, and we often have really robust conversations about, about representation, about how to do that. Um, I think when I worked on this employment project with people who had worked in ADEs, we talked a lot about what we shared in common. So we had experienced discrimination we had lived on the disability support pension we had been poor <laughs> we had uh, had people be mean to us at work we'd experienced bullying we'd had lots of things in common 
but I've never worked in an ADE. I've never been paid sub-minimum wages. I have never used Easy Read and I've never been under guardianship. So there are lots of experiences that I don't have that I've got to learn about and got to understand. But I do think that people with disability, all people with disability, do need to be in leadership positions and do need to be leading the change that we have come. Um, Chris, well, um, do you want to... If I add to that and just say I would it would have been wonderful to have had, you know, most of the Royal Commission people with disabilities. I think that would have been outstanding. And for one of them to have been an intellectually disabled person. We set up a small group. It was um it, it was sort of um advisory, but not on the whole lot. It was sort of restricted. And we had a person with intellectual disability on that. But it would have been great to have had an intellectual disabled commissioner. Very appropriate. Would have been very appropriate. And I might add too, I mean, you know, we see the 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 board of the NDIS now says it's got people with disabilities on it, but it doesn't have a person with intellectual disability. Um, and, you know, it took a lot of, of leadership by CID um, and Inclusion Australia to to actually establish the independent advisory group um, for, and have a subgroup for people with intellectual disabilities who are a, really a very significant group within the scheme. But that still leaves the question, I think, though, and I think we're beginning to do it much better of including and I of including people with intellectual disabilities in speaking about their issues. The self advocacy groups are are really building up people's confidence to do that. Um, but what, where does that leave people with severe and profound intellectual disability who, although they can express their preferences about particular things, will really find it impossible to speak about broader conceptual issues? Like, who is it that, that will be able to represent that group? Because I think there's a strong feeling amongst particularly some of the service providers um, and some of the academics that that group just gets left out all the time that we tend to default to talking about people with milder intellectual disabilities because we can hear from them. So do you have some ideas about that, how we might do tackle that one? Yeah, I mean, in my world, they're not left out. Like the needs of people with significant and complex support needs are front and centre in how we're talking about the NDIS review, for example, uh, how we respond to the Royal Commission. We've just had, I've had a number of conversations this week about how do we make sure that the people who are the most hurt and harmed are at the centre of how we respond? And so, yeah, we are thinking about how to do that. And some of it is listening to families and some of it is working with providers. And I know that that's not always uh, something that people are fond to do, but I know as Rhonda has done in the past, there are things that we do have to talk with providers about because for Lots of people with disability. Providers will be in their lives all of their lives. And talking with providers, I've been part of the Australian Disability Dialogue, which has been a process where we have sat down with people with disability and providers and allies to see if we can come up with consensus on key issues. Um, and it has been um, interesting, a process uh, to go through, and some of it's been successful, some of it we're working on it. Uh, but I think that kind of process to bring us together with the interests of people who have the least say and the least voice is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we don't always do it well, but I also think that a lot of the work that we are doing possibly isn't as visible to you or to, to outside of the advocacy world um, as it could be. I think the, the conversations that we are having around that are really important and are getting better at making sure that the people that we are centering are, uh, you know, the way that we responded to the Royal Commission, for example, we made sure to call out that the most hurt and harm have been done to First Nations people and to people with an intellectual disability. And that was put in our joint statement from all of the national disability representative organisations, which I think is a, is a significant step to say that we do acknowledge and understand who is the most harmed from the systems of exclusion that we've been talking about. Mm. Yeah, I, I see this shift. It's you can see it in the Royal Commission report that there's a there's a, a beginning shift to recognizing the diversity among people with disabilities that really wasn't there in the early days of the of the NDIS. And you know, our research shows 
particularly strongly that the quality of support every day that people get in group homes is much worse for people with higher support needs than it is for people with milder intellectual disabilities because people with high support needs really don't make many demands on staff so they don't get a lot of attention so i think that's you know it's a major issue for the, for those people but there's a question in the in the from the audience about um which relates to that which is about training um, and it's asking what formal training should the NDIS require? And they're using the word care workers. Um, and and how, how do you know uh, what sort of education care workers should have? And I know that's a, that's a very broad question because there's a, there's a, a push from particularly people who are self-managing that training really isn't important and it's about people's values. Um, and anyway, people can self-direct and tell the support worker what it is they want. But again, that doesn't work well for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. So do you have views about training for workers, whether it should be mandatory, what it should be like? Look, I have some views on that. I think that there's a mixture, I think, for people providing support for people, as you say, who self-manage. I think the research has shown very clearly that people... Uh, are selecting workers much more on attitudes rather than qualifications. Um, but I think for people who require personal support, Michelin, do you want to talk about that? What it's like in terms of do you do you prefer people who have qualifications around personal support? Um, for me, um, as for a lot of people who self-manage, um, it is about the attitudes and the values and um, their understanding about their their roles, um, and um, and we provide our own training. But um, where the person, um, I mean, there are just some things that people need to really understand where people have um, significant, profound um, disabilities, for instance, like. Um, it's about training about how to be a good listener, about training about what choice and control actually means that, you know, that there's no real choice if, if there, there aren't actually other valid options there, for instance, and, that, um, and also that you can make choices. Um, I mean, you can accept for yourself a certain amount of risk, but where does the risk become um, unacceptable? Um, and I mean, there are principles there about where it the risk um, might result in irreversible harm, and and there is is one step where where you wouldn't say that's a, a real choice. So just to understand um, um, issues like that, but then also, of course, where expertise is required um, for example for recovery principles for people with mental illness yeah Rhonda do you want to add anything on that um I'd like to just add that I think there does need to be a new type of training called um, inclusion how do you include people in the community and you know so there's I think that the specialised training for peg feeding, feeding or, you know, that has a quasi-medical, that's really important. I think um, in what I call closed segregated settings, there should definitely be training. But you know what? I think one of the primary um, areas would be supported decision-making. To, to bring that in to those settings should be absolutely a paramount importance you know um, and I must say I haven't heard of that in there yet but you might know that that it is and um, you know I think that it'd be marvellous if you if every worker in a group home was trained in supported decision making it would be make a real difference. Well I can't I can't finish tonight without making the plug for active support um, I see in the Royal Commission there's a recommendation for seven that says um, uh, which is about improving the quality of support in group homes and implementing the recommendations of the own motion inquiry, which suggested that 
active support and practice leadership should be embedded within all services that are providing um, group homes. And I think if you carefully unpack active support, it's embedded in it is choice and control, supporting people to exercise choice and control and supporting people to be engaged in their own lives and picking up as many alternate opportunities as possible, both in their home and in the community. And it's moving beyond um, a value base that people should, should accept those values, but it's giving basic skills to workers who don't have those skills about how to support people to make decisions, to exercise choice and control and to be engaged. And I think that's the missing piece um, in, in the training at the moment. We, we teach people about rights and, and values and attitudes, but we need to teach them skills as well. Um, and I think if we had much better leadership of practice across the board, then it wouldn't be left to the sole workers um, without, with very little training to make their own decisions about how they go around providing support. Um, I don't know whether you have views about that. Anybody else, Elle, um, does, I mean, it, it's very similar to the type of work we know about supporting people to be employed. Um, yeah, and I think um, the incentives, as Rhonda and Michelin have talked about within the NDIS, are not there to do that kind of work. There's not the time. Workers don't have enough time to do that. And there isn't the incentives to actually encourage it. So the review I've been really pleased to see has, has really called that out and sort of talked about that sort of, um, uh, I, want, I don't want to call it low value, but the kind of support work that doesn't um, support a person to be included and to have decisions and to um, have a say about their lives. That's what's actually encouraged. And so that kind of um, the quantity of service service delivery rather than the quality is what is encouraged in the current um, service model with the NDIS um, and innovations um, aren't actually funded or supported. So we have these sort of small scale projects and ILC grants, information linkages and capacity building, sorry, a bit of jargon there, um, but small scale projects where we see innovative practice um, and but we're not actually seeing the kind of wider scale adoption of it by providers, but also within the funding model so that families could get together and kind of say, we wanted to do this differently and this is how we do it. Any kind of innovation at the moment that is away from old school models of support is incredibly difficult to do. So when families want to support a person with disability to do a micro business, for example, have a coffee cart or do recycling or art or some other kind of um, small business. It's extremely difficult to do. Uh, so anything outside of these sort of um, uh, separate models of support, particularly for people with intellectual disability, is still very difficult to do. Whereas for disabled people like me and Michelin and Rhonda, it's not that difficult to do. And so I think that for me, that is the injustice part of the NDIS, where it has worked for lots of people with disability, but particularly for people with an intellectual disability, it is still looking an awful lot like the old support system, but with less choice, less eyes on them, more, you know, violence and abuse, as we've seen from the Royal Commission and the own motion inquiry from the Quality and Safeguards Commission, and less of this innovation, less of them having a say, less kind of ideas around that. So I think as we see the hopefully the review and the Royal Commission kind of mush together the recommendations as they go, we will start to really see change and see the community be supported to do the changes that they want. But I think we need to be we 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 need to acknowledge that in the certainly in the accommodation space there has been there is being innovation. Um, many group homes are becoming smaller. Um, Organisations are building um, different variations. Uh, where two or three people might live together or people might live individual, individually with support that drops in. But the problem is we tend to talk about models as if the model and the bricks and mortar and the number of people are what is going to make a difference. And we don't focus on actually it's the quality of the support that goes into that model, into that framework that's probably the most important thing. We tend to get obsessed, I think, with, with models of innovation um, and, and those sorts of bigger picture things. But I, I think there are alternatives, but we just need more research about how to make them work well. Um, 
the research that there is about alternatives to group homes basically says that people end up often fairly isolated without good community connections and without good support and life isn't much better for some people than it would be in a group home. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of really good innovation that's happening. Uh, the what's it called? The ILO um, is it ILO where there's combinations of formal and informal support. And some families are doing some really innovative things. But again, it takes a lot of energy from families themselves, doesn't it? It does. Right. And it's still a small number. So I think ILO is really 1,200 people, I think, in the last year. Compared to folks uh, in SIL, it's still 30,000 people. So we're still seeing a kind of smaller number uh, being able to do that. And I think being able to set up the systems within the NDIS that do encourage the innovation, as you say, both in terms of practice and in terms of housing itself, um, I think are really important. And the conversations we had in the disability dialogue were fascinating because it went through to how do we support people who've never rented, for example, to get into private rental, if that's what they wanted to do, if they've never had a reference and all of this kind of thing. So it was a really interesting sort of thoughts, um, how do we do something about some of those legacy group homes and the land that they're sitting on and re, um, repurpose them for people with, with an intellectual disability so that they maintain that equity and that kind of value of homes that they've lived in for 30 years. So there was a lot of um, conversations about how do we actually make sure that people get different options and choices um, as well as being able to, as you say, be much more in the community and included in the community. Yeah, and so the, so there is some innovation happening. It's just not not no. very visible my, and not huge. My suggestion is is that um, to make this much more systemised and lifted up across Australia, I think the government needs to set up a group with people with disabilities and you know get a market vision. Like, what do we want from the market? What are the innovations? What are the issues in work and living and um you know recreation and all of the the areas and get that vision and then get the strategies i think it's sort of putting flesh on the market stewardship notion you know a process that sort of hasn't occurred but it should be people with disabilities definitely in there um with the government and the market experts it should if they're not there then it won't work I think it goes back to one of the things that Elle said before about the information linkages and capacity building grants that have been one off short term um, and, and none of the really good things that have come out of that have been able to continue because there's no long term programmatic funding for those sorts of things. And, and, and hopefully that will be something that might come out of the NDIS review that actually funding innovation over time for longer periods of time. Um, so you can actually evaluate it properly and then embed it into a system might might work better. Sorry, Rhonda, you wanted to say I something? I just think it's bigger than the ILC. I think the ILC, I'd love to see peer support supported and strengthened across Australia with you know, proper grants um, that are made through the ILC and technical support to peer support groups so they can also progress and develop. Um, I think a systemised, not not a granting program, more an absolute commitment to peer support. And in the Productivity Commission report, they were called disability support organisations. And I read that closely and thought, ah, that's the little carers group or the, you know, the local um, intellectual disability volunteering group or whatever. I mean, there are groups all across Australia that are just little gems that I think ought to get ILC funds and um, be able to then attract more members, get the conversations going and somehow feed into a process for a market vision and then a stewardship strategy. I think that's really important for the NDIS. There's a long history of self-advocacy groups and, and those peer support groups and being funded, you know, at the end of financial years with the leftover money and there's no consistency, there's no, you know, no consistent workers, and that's not a way to operate those really important groups. So I think that's a very we important... We need more group. of them, don't we? We need more of them. We need one for everybody that wants one. Mm. And, the, and, and, 
And we need good supporters for those groups too. I mean, they they don't work without really good support. I'm really and conscious that we've got to we we've got to half past six, um, and we need to bring this to a close. Um, I think we might just take a minute or more. Does do anybody want to say some last comments? Um, Micheline, you've been quiet. Do you want to say something to finish? Um, just to follow on from the talk about funding um, innovations and other programs that will help participation, too much emphasis is put on um, the um, people with disabilities making the business case for inclusion. Government has a responsibility to govern for all. And if government's going to um, um, avoid that responsibility, uh, or say it's too expensive, then they should have the onus of making the business case for why there is exclusion of part of the community. Mm. The onus is always on people to prove things, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Rhonda, do you want to say a, a couple of things to finish? Well, I completely agree with Micheline. and I think it's in government's interest, dare I say, it is a business case for them to actually include people with disabilities. I think it's um, it's what's missing and, and it's what's making in part the NDIS, you know, really um, the costs blow out. That it's the, as Bruce Bonnie Haley says, it's the only game in town. So it, it pushes people in there because out of there, you know, you, the health system is inaccessible, education's knocking you back, transport, as we've heard from Micheline, is just so far behind. And housing too, and I, I think it just that's really important. And it's the CRPD, it's the treaty that demands that too. So I think it's about time. I completely agree with Micheline. Okay, El, last words. Oh, I think I'd write, I want us to be included because we're part of the community, but also because you know we're fantastic innovators, problem solvers, funny people. Disabled people are hilarious. Um, but also because I think that uh, when we are in your cricket club, serving you at Bunnings, you know, sitting next to you at the pub, your next door neighbour, we're less likely to be hurt and harmed, as the Royal Commission has found. And I think that's my primary uh, focus. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I just can't finish without making an ad for um, the Living with Disability Research Centre runs a seminar every month. Uh, we've been doing it online ever since COVID um, and it's free and we share our research around turning some of the policy visions into reality and around good practice for people with intellectual disabilities. So all of that information is available on the resources um, tab and on the La Trobe University website. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you for all the questions. They've really uh, sort of helped and guided our discussion. Um, and I'm sure the university will look forward to seeing you again at the next Ideas and Event Society, uh, Ideas and Society event. Um, so we might finish there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.